So thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, today we have Indrajit Dillon speaking to us from Amazon and UT Austin, and he's going to be talking about some extreme multi-label classification work that they've recently been doing. So thanks and feel free to take it away, Indrajit. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tavor. Uh, thank you for having me. Let me start uh, sharing my screen. Okay, let me just uh, know if you can all see the screen, or at least Tavor, you can tell me. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, today I'll talk about uh, multi scale methods uh, for machine learning. As Tavor mentioned, uh, I'm a professor at uh, UT Austin on leave at Amazon. And uh, some of the methods that I'm talking about today are actually inspired by large scale problems uh, at uh, Amazon. So here's the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll first uh, talk a little bit about multiple multi output prediction and the challenges, especially the scale challenges that they impose when the number of outputs can be in the millions to even a billion. And then I will introduce uh, in response to these challenges, I'll introduce our framework machine learning framework called PECOS that stands for prediction for enormous and correlated output spaces. This uh, framework or method involves first a multi-scale organization of the output space, then training the machine learning model, and then we need to do inference and that needs to be done for real-time applications. So I'll talk about fast inference methods uh, and finally, I'll conclude with uh, an application on semantic search. So, sorry, uh, excuse me. I think we can't see the screen share part. We can see your screen, but it's not in presentation mode. Oh. The slides aren't not. advancing. Yeah. Okay, something I saw is it says. Uh, let me just see. Uh, do you see an advance in the slide now? Yes. Yep. Yeah, but I guess when I put it on Control L, I got a message saying that sharing is paused. Bring your shared window to the front. Maybe I think I you might need to share the, the different window. Then. Maybe I should have. Let me just start sharing again. Okay. Let me share the doc. Maybe I shared the screen by mistake. Okay. Okay. Do you see the? Yes. See the yeah. Advancing now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So you know, typically when I teach uh, an introductory machine learning course, we talk about uh, single output uh, uh, problems, both in regression and in classification. Right, so the setting is that you have in the regression case, the setting is that you have like a single output variable, a uh, real valued response, which we will call as Y. And the goal is to predict the response for a new uh, D dimensional data point. And as is the case in machine uh, learning and statistics, we are given training data X1 through Xn. And then the goal is to the goal is to find these coefficients uh, w, and uh, if you are doing linear regression, then we are estimating the output by a linear function of the given data. Right. So this problem, of course, we know how to solve well when we use uh, least squares uh, objective, and uh, in fact, in the least squares case. We know that there is a closed form solution given by the famous uh, normal equations. Similarly, when we have a classification and we are trying to classify, for example, the red crosses away from the blue dots, we want to try and predict uh, this categorical response for a new data point X that is represented in some D-dimensional space. And very popular are linear methods, 
uh, where the decision boundary is either is a linear surface or in D dimensions a hyperplane. So here is like a picture that shows this linear decision boundary that is separating the red crosses from the blue dots. So uh, for these uh, uh, linear methods uh, with single outputs, in the regression case, we have, uh, for example, ridge regression, where you have to have, a reg you want to have a regularization term, so you don't overfit to the data. In ridge regression, you have the L2 square uh, 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 um, uh, regularization. And uh, in the lasso case, you have L1 regularization, which promotes sparsity among the coefficients. And in the classification case, uh, you might have like a max margin uh, approach, which also leads to an objective function that you can think of as a loss function plus regularization. In the SVM case, the loss function ends up being uh, a hinge loss, which is non-differentiable. And uh, in the case of logistic regression, you have a log loss. So uh, linear methods do form sort of the bread and butter of uh, many uh, machine learning approaches. If you look at uh, common machine learning textbooks, for example, the textbook from uh, by Hasty, Tipsharani, and Friedman, you can see an extensive treatment, chapter three, linear methods for regression, chapter four, linear methods for classification. And if you look at a contemporary book by uh, Chris Bishop, uh, ironically, it is uh, chapter three, linear methods for regression, chapter four, linear methods for classification. Today, I will talk about multi-output prediction, where you not only have uh, one output uh, uh, variable, but actually multiple output variables. So let me motivate that by some examples. Right? So here is a problem which can be thought of as a Wikipedia tag recommendation problem. So here you have uh, a Wikipedia page. This Wikipedia page happens to be on machine learning. And down below, if you look at, there are categories that have been assigned by people uh, uh, to this particular Wikipedia page. For example, you might not be able to see this, so I have reproduced it over here. The tags are learning and computer vision, machine learning, learning, and cybernetics. So as you can tell, the, the tags are somewhat incomplete, somewhat noisy. And then if you look at the collection of Wikipedia pages, you realize that there are going to be many, many, many tags. Now, if you start thinking of each tag as a possible output, you now realize that there can be millions of tags. I told you that I uh, have been spending some time uh, at Amazon. So in Amazon, you have the problem of product search where customers type in their queries. And in response, uh, you want to see products. Now, there are many, many, many products. If you think of each product as an output, you can think again of this as a multi-output problem right and you can think of it as a prediction problem which is trying to predict what the customer is looking for in response to their query so again if you go back to the to the textbooks uh um you know i i you know chapter three is linear methods for regression but there is a small section over there on multiple outputs there is no section in chapter four on multiple outputs and then similarly in Chris Bishop's book, there's a small section on multiple outputs. Again, no section on multiple outputs in the classification part. But that is what I'm talking about over today. So we, I, I uh, kind of gave you the setting before where we had just one response variable. Now you have multiple response variables. And in particular, there are little m response variables or little m outputs. Now, I can do linear prediction uh, similarly to the way I had set the single uh, output case. And uh, you can just generalize it by 
thinking of the prediction as x w is nearly equal to y yet let's think of this multi output regression problem and if you just assume that the outputs are independent it's a very straightforward extension right and the output is now just this particular uh, 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 least squares problem where instead of having the two norm you have the frobenius norm square and there's a closed form solution and this time i've chosen to give the closed form solution in terms of the svd of uh, uh, of x and um, uh, the reason i've done that is that you know you might think about trying to say that instead of having these coefficient vectors be independent can i actually add some kind of uh, structure which uh, captures the fact that maybe these outputs will be correlated so in particular you can impose a low rank structure on w and it turns out through the wonders of the singular value decomposition that uh, you can actually get this in closed form solution in terms of the svd of x now when we look at classification problems you can have multi-class classification or you can have multi-label problems where more than one label might be relevant to um, uh, to the input, uh, as in the examples that I talked about, both in uh, Wikipedia and uh, in the product search example. So in the multi-label setting, you can try and have an independent binary classifier for each label. That would be the analog of try basically assuming that all the outputs are independent. And sometimes this is known as uh, binary relevance now let's look at let's do a little uh, uh back of the envelope calculations to see what would happen if we just took this naive approach of having an independent binary classifier for each output or each label when the number of labels is uh large let's say uh so consider this wikipedia data set where capital L is the number of labels and let's say assume think of this as half a million right in some sense it is a toy problem from the point of view of an industry strength application and we'll come to that suppose I have uh, 1.5 million uh, Wikipedia pages in my uh, training uh, uh, set uh, and suppose my vocabulary is of size 2.5 million that's the total number of tokens or words in the collection of the Wikipedia pages. And let's suppose my average document length is about 1000. So what that means is that each X, which represents the Wikipedia document, will only have about 1000 non zeros in this very high dimensional uh, representation of the document. Uh, and so it's a very highly sparse representation. Now, Suppose we have uh, construct these one versus rest classifiers, and there are going to be capital L of them. Suppose I assume that each classifier can be trained in about 50 seconds, which is actually reasonable for state of the art software such as liblinear when you're doing uh, something like support vector machine or logistic regression with this kind of dimensionality and uh, this number, this amount of sparsity. So if you assume that, then the overall training time will be, you know, in excess of two years on one CPU. And if you try and then use a multi-core machine, let's say 16 cores, and you assume that you have perfect parallelization, it'll still be nearly two months to just train one model. Moreover, the memory will be prohibitive, right? Assuming no further structure on the, uh, the classifier coefficients, it'll require five terabytes of uh, memory. And now if you think of starting to trying to do it in, you know, your uh, uh, using deep learning applications, Suppose you want to try and have like a soft max over these capital L labels, L would be as much as half a million, then you can see that uh, the overall training time will be actually much worse than what I've outlined above, right, as all the parameters will need to be trained. And the memory footprint will still be, if you think of that big soft max that's going to be uh, uh, at the end, 
which is trying to predict per label, that softmax is going to be huge. And so the memory footprint is still going to be five terabytes. So this back of the envelope calculation just says that the naive approaches are just going to be prohibitively expensive. So in response, we have uh, this uh, machine learning framework and associated software called Pecos. So let me motivate it by problems at uh, Amazon. So a common task at Amazon, so I've already kind of touched upon the product search example, where you have a query and we want to return a ranked list of items. You may have a keyword recommendation problem where given a particular product and its text description, you may want to try and predict what queries will be used to purchase it or you may want to try and look at related searches. So if a customer types in choose related queries, then maybe a related search will be a related shoe query. So all these examples are different, different use cases. This might be customer facing, this might be seller facing. The common task is the following. Given an input, which is in text form, we want to pro provide predictions from these really, really large output spaces. The output space in the product search is the set of all products. The output space in the keyword recommendation problem is a set of all queries. So these are enormous uh, output spaces. However, there are going to be correlations between the items in the output space. So before I uh, go into the details of uh, how we've, uh, what kind of methods we use, uh, we actually just uh, open sourced uh, this software and uh, there was a blog article that accompanied it. So um, please feel free to take it for, for a spin. So let's come back to this multi output or very large, uh, very large output space, uh, these problems. Well, we can have millions of outputs, even billions of outputs, if you think about the product search example. Now, one of the characteristics of this is that the most of the values are actually missing. So I did not specify that too much before. But this is not a problem where all the values over here in the response matrix are actually known. Th these are typically interactions between inputs and outputs. And not only are many values missing, but generally you only know positive examples. So sometimes this is called positive unlabeled learning, right? And like I said, there are correlations between outputs and in many cases like product search, you need to have real time inference. So again, sort of reiterating, uh, the enormous output space means that it is very computationally expensive for training. You cannot have inference be linear in the number of outputs. And then what is true in many of real data sets is that you know the outputs have a long tail distribution what does that mean even though you may have uh, uh, 100 million let's say products right there is going to be paucity of interactions or training data for many of these outputs so the, we can regard these as tail outputs and like i said before that only positive training examples uh, are typically available. So what PECOS does is it provides computationally efficient schemes for training. And by design, the inference is designed to be in uh, time, which is logarithmic in the output space size. It exploits correlation to transfer training data from head to tail outputs. And then when it does its training, it efficiently infers strong negatives. So let's start into let's let's go into start going into a little bit of details. So the first thing that we want to do is try and organize this enormous output space in some way. So one way is to do hierarchical clustering. If I look at the training data, 
And if I think of this as an interaction matrix, let's suppose for simplicity, it's just a binary matrix, right? With ones for uh, the presence of observation, uh, observ interaction between the input and the output. So this is a rectangular matrix where the inputs are the rows, outputs are the columns. Well, you can regard it as a bipartite graph between the inputs and the outputs. And it is going to be an extremely, typically it's going to be an extremely sparse graph, especially when the number of rows and columns are in the millions. So one thing you can look at is, you can take this sparse graph, and now you can think of trying to do graph partitioning in this bipartite graph. So what do I mean by graph partitioning? Well, you wanna try and get a set of inputs and a set of outputs such that there are very few edges that cross between the two different partitions, right? And similarly, you can do this uh, recursively. And that's how you can get a hierarchical organization on the output space. So let's make that a little bit more concrete. So you can look at uh, what are called weighted graph cut objectives. Um, graph partitioning, by the way, is a, is a very rich uh, uh, area. And uh, what I'm talking about now are the spectral methods for optimizing these weighted graph cut objectives. So in particular, uh, uh, you have you know, this weighted graph cut objective where the cut is normalized by the weight of each partition. If you don't do that, then you can end up getting uh, partitions that are you know, very small and one partition being very small and one partition being very large. And you want to try and get, you know, uh, weighty partitions. And that's why you're normalized by this weight. Now, given a graph, I can form uh, the graph Laplacian of the graph. And then what you can show is that for an appropriate discrete vector Q, you can represent this, you can, this weighted graph cut objective is exactly equal to this Rayleigh quotient. So this is Q transpose LQ divided by Q transpose WQ. And you can prove, uh, and what you can show is that this Rayleigh quotient, we want to try and minimize this, this Rayleigh quotient, subject to a particular orthogonality constraint, is solved when this vector q, if I relax the discrete constraint, is the eigenvector that corresponds to the second smallest eigenvalue of a generalized eigenvalue problem. And sometimes this is called the Fiedler vector. Fiedler generally did not study these weighted partitions. And so, you know, in his case, uh, there was nothing on the right hand side, it was just lambda z. But when you look at weighted partitions, then this becomes a generalized eigenvalue problem. Now, if you look at the uh, adjacency, sorry, the La graph Laplacian for um, a bipartite graph, uh, it actually ends up having this structure. Uh, and you can do a little bit of algebra and show that essentially these eigenvectors become the singular vectors of, of the matrix A, right? Or weighted versions of this matrix A, right? D1 and D2 in this case are diagonal matrices that correspond to the row degrees of the, of the matrix A and the column degrees of the matrix A, right? So, you don't actually have to form this uh, uh, Laplacian, but you can just work with the singular value decomposition and you can then use the singular vectors of you know this matrix I'm calling here before I had called it as the training data Y, right? And you can do this. And now you can do it recursively you can do it uh, by doing recursive bipartitions, or you can try and do recursive multipartitions. And there is some advantage in trying to do multipartitions. But what happens when you try and do multipartitions? That means now you have more than one partition. Uh, 
is that you typically need to compute more eigenvectors, and that can be computationally expensive for a large graph. So what you can what you can show in that case is um, so, so let me back up a little bit. So if I have this very, very large bipartite graph now, right? Millions of nodes on the left side, millions of nodes on the right side. This method still requires you to compute uh, singular vectors um, of the graph. The question is, can you actually do spectral clustering without computing any eigenvectors or singular vectors? Sounds like it won't be possible, but it turns out that it is. So um, I think I worked on this with a student uh, a while ago, a couple of students, Guan and uh, Brian Kulis. And what we showed is that you can actually optimize these graph cuts without computing eigenvectors. And it relies on um, uh, showing that this particular objective Right? Over here, we showed that it is equivalent to a normalized uh, 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 Rayleigh quotient, but you can actually also show that it is mathematically equivalent to what's called a weighted kernel k-means objective. Now, uh, I'm not going to bother about what weighted kernel k-means is. Um, you know, the name is fairly suggestive for people who do know uh, k-means. But what is the most important part is that it gives you an algorithm which can take an input partition and decrease the objective. Okay? There's no guarantee of finding a global minima or so, but it will decrease, it will basically take an input partitioning and improve it. And so what we ended up doing was that we exploited the framework that was offered by this other uh, 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 scheme, which is MEDIS, which is a, a multi-level scheme for partitioning irregular graphs. But in that scheme, they get the partitions to be of equal size. So we adapted that methodology and said, okay, we'll take this input graph, we'll repeatedly coarsen it. And when I say coarsen it, it's very simple coarsening. It's like merging edges together. And so you get, in the beginning, you have a, 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 a graph with many nodes. Then you coarsen it. You get a graph with half the number of nodes. Keep on coarsening, keep on coarsening, till you get to a small enough graph that you can then do, you know, you can actually use, for example, spectral clustering or a more expensive method. And then what you can do is you can then lift up this coarsened graph to be identical to this. But then by applying this weighted kernel k-means, you can refine the partition, refine the partition, refine the partition. And finally, you get a partitioning of the original graph. And I'm not going to go into details, but it turns out that you can do this, uh, you know, without even invoking any, uh, I think, floating point computations if your uh, graph has uh, integer weights. And the reason it works quite well in practice is because you end up solving the problem at multiple scales, right? I could have just done this in the input graph. But it turns out that it's then susceptible to the usual problems that k-means is susceptible to. But by doing this, by solving the graph at multiple scales, you end up getting a scheme that uh, uh, is very fast and actually produces pretty good results. So this is one way to organize the very large output space. So let me now return to that example about uh, uh, product search. So suppose I have these uh, products, right? So suppose I have, uh, you know, some iPads and some cameras and some tablets, then typically there is some featureization that one can do, right? And once we do the featureization, we'll do a first level clustering, then we will do a second level clustering. And so you can see over here, you have iPads versus surfaces, and here you have DSLRs versus, you know, other digital cameras. 
And now you can construct what we call a semantic index over your very, very large output space. So once we've done constructed this um, uh, very large output space and this hierarchy, the question is how will you actually do prediction? Right? Suppose I have a query that comes in. What I would want to do is suppose that there was a the query related to tablets. Then I would want to come to this node over here and have like a router which does not go this way on the right, but ends up going only on the left. Okay, and we will do it by training a machine learning model over here. And we'll end up tra training a machine learning model at every node of this hierarchy, which will finally end up giving me the relevant uh, result. So when we are training, what we will end up doing is uh, at every layer of this tree, we will obtain these coefficients, the ones, for example, I talked about before, by solving, uh, you know, an empirical risk minimization problem, the kind that I mentioned to you early on, right? Except now that I have multiple uh, uh, coefficient vectors to find, but note that these coefficient vectors are not capital L, the same size as the total number of outputs uh, uh, labels. But at each node, it is K, KL. And KL is modest, something like 30 or 60, or, you know, at the base level, you can even just use two. So in the case of, let's say, ranking or classification, we use a point-wise loss function, such as hinge loss or uh, logistic loss. Um, for each input xi, right, this summation is only over the positive labels for this input instance xi. And we actually, I haven't talked too much, but there are a couple of methods in PECOS using which we infer what are believed to be hard negatives. When these XIs are highly sparse, as in the Wikipedia example or in the product search example, uh, you actually also want these Ws, these coefficient vectors, to be quite sparse. And it turns out that we can actually make these vectors extremely sparse by, you know, you can think about trying to add an L1 penalty, uh, 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 L1 uh, regularization, or you can even be more aggressive and do something like an L0 penalty uh, and essentially truncate small entries, threshold them to zero, and that leads to very, very sparse uh, uh, vectors. So that's the training phase. So at the end of this training phase, we basically end up having coefficient vectors at each of these uh, internal nodes. Okay, uh, so at each node of the hierarchical tree, a linear model is learned, and we use sophisticated packages like liblinear to solve these. Uh, well, these are not necessarily, well, they are binary classification problems because we can exchange these summations, right, and basically do things for each label with positive and negative uh, uh, um, instances. Um, for text inputs, we use, you know, a vectorization function, something which is very simple and I've been alluding to in terms of trying to be sparse is this uh, TFIDF or term frequency inverse document frequency uh, vectorization. So X over here is highly, um, is very high dimensional, but sparse. But at the same time, you can use more sophisticated uh, methods which vectorize your input sequence of uh, tokens. So you can use something like uh, BERT to get a representation of the input. So in PECOS, we have support for both of these. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure all of you in this audience are aware of uh, BERT and these deep transformer models that use this uh, self-attention mechanism uh, 
and have resulted in state-of-the-art results in many uh, tasks which are in uh, natural language processing. So what we can do in PECOS is to actually have a learnable encoder. So on top of the vectorization that we get for each uh, input, we learn a mapping from the input to the labels, right? But we don't do it all the way to the individual labels, but only towards the uh, clusters in this uh, uh, tree. And we can develop actually a recursive transformer model. And what we found to perform the best is a transformer model where uh, not only I use the bird embeddings, but also TF ideas. So we have a combination of sparse uh, uh, embeddings as well as dense embeddings. So now the question is how to do inference. Okay. So after training, right? And after a particular kind of embedding, for now, I think we let's just concentrate on the TFIDF kind of embedding. So let's think about X as being very sparse, the coefficient vectors W1 being extremely sparse too. Okay. And now we have this entire organization. Right, and at the bottom level are individual elements of this output space. Right, so these are, for example, each one of these is, let's say, a product for the product search example. Now, given this input, I can develop like a scoring function for each of these potential outputs. But of course, that will be too expensive. Right in the example that I pointed out, for you know, where we had uh, iPads versus other products, you know, you know that there are only going to be a few relevant items, so you want to try and hone in on them very quickly and carefully, uh, and ignore the rest. So one way to do it is to do beam search. So what you can do is, so here is sort of the pseudocode for Pecos inference at a high level. You know, let's suppose we have a beam size of two, right? So what will end up happening is that you uh, have an input, it goes to the root, you find the top two scoring nodes or clusters, and then you pursue only those directions till you get all the way to the leaf nodes. And so you can think of the scoring function as, and you can use various things, right? So you basically do an inner product at each of these internal nodes. And then the final score is a composition of the scores along the path, right? This uh, composition can either be multiplication, could be addition, and the sigma could be some squashing function like used in deep learning, uh, for example, the sigmoid function, right? But now to do these computations, you uh, need to do a bunch of these uh, matrix vector multiplications, and you want to try and do them efficiently. But before we get into that, uh, by design, this method is now going to be logarithmic in the size of the output space. So in particular, if you just have a tree with uh, depth, uh, well, depth, and we have B array partitions, and we use a beam size of little b, then you can, you can see that this is going to be the time complexity for doing inference. Right? Because you're limiting yourself to a beam size of little b, which is less than capital B. And then if you use depth, which is logarithmic in the uh, label size or the output space size, then you can see that the overall complexity is going to be logarithmic in the number of labels. But there is still if you if you want to really tackle the product search example, you actually have to be fairly efficient, 
right? So it turns out that most of the work, most of the computations end up in these matrix matrix multiplications. So over here, uh, note that what we are calling X over here is actually uh, uh, a, a set of inputs. So this is what's uh, in the in the this is batch inference. So that you have multiple inputs that are batched together, and then you want to try and do inference on these multiple inputs. And each input will end up taking a different path in this tree. Right. So you want so this is the pseudocode that represents doing binary search uh, uh, and doing only those relevant matrix vector multiplication matrix matrix multiplications but still you know there is the even when we do this we find that most of the work is spent in this matrix multiplication and essentially this corresponds to uh, taking your batch of inputs right and doing matrix matrix multiplications along the coefficient vectors at a particular level. So, you know, over here, if you look at this M, this is what's called a mask matrix. And I'm just going to spend a little bit of time uh, about how we do this, end up doing this uh, efficiently. In fact, uh, there was a, uh, an intern from uh, Stanford who came last summer uh, Philip Etter, who did uh, quite a bit of this work. So here is, uh, uh, let's suppose we have uh, five inputs. So my matrix X is uh, five by D. And suppose at a particular, uh, suppose, you know, for X1, it's only the first and the third part of the tree of the beam that are important, right? So, so the for uh, so that means for x one I want to go only in this. Oh, oh sorry, x one I want to go only in this path and this path, right? I do not need to pursue this path or this path. For x two, I'm pursuing this and this path. And similarly, x three. Remember the beam over here is two. So for every input, we only pursue two two uh, paths right? so what we need to do is we need to uh, uh, we're going to do beam search right so what end up happening is we will need to for x1 we will need to compute these four vector matrix products and these four vector matrix products for x2 we'll compute x1 times w for these four and x1 times w for these four so that's what these patterns represent over here right and those are the operations we need to perform nothing else we don't want to perform these operations because they are not needed okay so in terms of uh, trying to do these efficiently note that we are in the case where X is highly sparse. These coefficient vectors are also uh, extremely sparse. You know, there are simple data structures that one can use. For example, you can represent X as a sparse vector, and you can represent the coefficients in what's called uh, compressed sparse column format. And then I'm not going to go into details, but basically it allows you to efficiently do the inner product between this and this vector uh, to get this value um, over two sparse arrays. But it turns out that that ends up being a little bit slow for the applications we had in mind. So it is much better to end up doing, organizing the data structure so that these weight matrices are organized in these chunks. Right, the chunks K0, K1, K2, K3, right? And basically we end up representing each of these chunks either in a column row uh, uh, storage form. And this allows us to do these operations efficiently. And it basically, why, the reason why it works well is that the cache, the efficiency of uh, the cache is uh, improved because you know, these are all kind of uh, 
similar labels because that's how we represented the output space. So many times there are dimensions along which there is non-zeros over here end up being common. Okay, and these are also sparse though. Okay? So again, I don't want to get into too much detail, but just want to see uh, kind of convey that uh, uh, that the you know the implementations if we have to be uh, meet you know strict latency requirements can be uh, um, uh, need to be thought of carefully okay so in particular like i mentioned this is the work that philip uh, did in his internship last summer we can see that we are able to improve the inference time by you know almost a factor of 10 Right? And a factor of 10 becomes quite important when you are trying to either deploy something uh, for a whole lot of traffic versus not being able to deploy. Okay, so let me now move on to some of the experimental results. So the Wikipedia example that I talked about, there's a public data set that is called Wiki 500K. And the reason why it's called 500K is because, you know, we have about uh, 500,000 or half a million um, uh, labels, which in this case are tags. And uh, I had mentioned, you know, a transformer based model and within PECOS we have like a recursive uh, uh, linear model. And uh, these are the precision results as well as recall results, right? And in comparison over here, we just compare with, you know, fast text where you do hierarchical softmax. You really can't do a full softmax because as I showed you in my um, uh, back of the envelope calculation, that will be too expensive. So we do see from here that the transformer model, the bird based model has, you know, the uh, essentially state of the art uh, precision and recall for output spaces of this size, right? And, uh, but it does come at a cost. So if, if you look at precision at one, you know, X transformer, the transformer based model does perform much better, but it needs uh, nearly two weeks of training on much more um, 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 meatier machine than the hierarchical linear model, which can actually be done on a CPU. So both these methods are available uh, in PECOS. But if you are a practitioner, you want to try and analyze, you know, the cost benefit trade off. And uh, similarly, if you want to look at uh, uh, doing inference in real time, right, this is a comparison. So if you look at Wiki 500K, you can actually do inference using uh, XR linear, the hierarchical linear model. And this is times are in milliseconds. So for each input, you can actually do an inference in about 21 milliseconds where on a CPU, whereas over here in the transformer model, it's actually much more, uh, more expensive. So let me now come back to the application that I've been hinting at throughout this talk, which is uh, semantic uh, product search. So we did a detailed study where we are trying to now do semantic search over 100 million products. And we, so we have to use a much meatier machine, right? But we are able to use, uh, uh, you know, in terms of AWS, it's what's called an X1 32X large. It has 128 uh, uh, cores, right? For the GPU comparisons, which is this deep semantic similarity uh, method, we have to use uh, GPU. For the deep learning method, we have to use the GPU based method. And so you can see that the GPU based methods are actually much more expensive. And in this case, at least, we're actually able to get pretty good precision and recall compared to these other, you know, two tower kind of models. And you can see that the training time is, you know, just over a day. And the model size is in the hundreds of uh, gigabytes. So just to kind of go back to this example, so what we want to try and do is given a query, retrieve all products that are, you know, semantically related. The catalog is huge and we want to try and do it in, you know, few milliseconds. 
So as I to told you, you know, in this cartoon example, I showed you that we organized it uh, in this uh, hierarchical clustering structure or what we call semantic indexing. Well, if you have 100 million items, then I think in the example that I'm going to talk about, we used uh, branching factor over here of 64. Right, so I think the height of the tree ends up becoming about uh, five or six. Right? So how does it work? Well, if an input comes in, such as tiny iPad, okay, note that this is not a conventional way of querying a mini iPad, right? So typically in descriptions of products, you won't see uh, the word tiny, uh, the mini iPad being referred to as a tiny iPad. But suppose you do this, suppose the query is tiny iPad, the way it'll be, uh, the results will be retrieved is that you'll basically have, you know, some machine learning model, the ones that I talked about, go, and here I've illustrated that the beam is of size two. And so you go from the root and you basically get all the way down to the individual 100 million items. So what we end up doing over here is have only 100 items in each uh, leaf node or 100 products. And we are able to do it in a latency of 1.74 milliseconds. And that's the what's called the P99 latency, which means that um, um, if you have like a batch of queries, then uh, 99 percentile time, the latency is less than equal to 1.74 milliseconds. So all this is now uh, a software uh, that uh, we've put uh, in uh, open source. This is the um, uh, GitHub link that I gave you uh, earlier. So if you're interested, you know, take it for a spin. Um, and I think now I will conclude. So. In conclusion, we are looking at problems where we have, you know, millions of outputs. The output space is very large, but what saves us is that there are correlations between these outputs. So we have developed this framework called uh, PECOS. The way PECOS works is we do a multi-scale organization, and we can do a hierarchical clustering using SVD. We can do highly efficient training where we have to do, you know. Uh, optimization for this, uh, uh, you know, sparse, we basically end up getting a hierarchical linear model, which is very sparse. I'm not talking about the transformer part, but the linear part. And then for the super fast inference with also the sparse part, we have this uh, method called mass sparse chunk multiplication. And as a result of this, the latency is in milliseconds. So uh, thank you to all the collaborators uh, I've had who have uh, really made this uh, work possible, especially putting the, you know, getting the software to a quality where we can open source it was uh, quite a huge effort. And uh, uh, I've talked about several things uh, in the talk and uh, at the end of the slides, I provided like a list of references. So um, that concludes my talk and I'll be happy to now take questions.